So I kind of want to jump in at just the very start. So how did Critical Role really begin? It grew out of a house game, but how did you take it from, from that to this massive digital entertainment conglomerate that you, you are now? Oh, man, that's a big question. I think we're still figuring that out. It's yeah. <laughs> Five words or less. Oh, uh, oh God. Felicia Day asked us to. Um, <laughs> that's how it started. We, 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 we were just playing at home. Uh, I've been playing since high school and uh, dragged this guy and a few other people who had never played before in for a one shot that turned into a home campaign for a couple of years. And then uh, so for a conversation between Ashley Johnson and Felicia at a party, she mentioned this D&D game of voice actors, and they were just ramping up their content on Geek and Sundry. And she went, well, why don't you guys do that on, on the network? And we went, uh, what? Yeah. Pe uh, people will watch us play D&D? <laughs> yeah, we were more skeptics than anything. We were like, yeah. nobody's going to watch this. We'll do it one time. Like 15 people will watch. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll be like, okay, that was fun. And even then, there was like some workshopping because the initial ideas was pre-Twitch. It was like we, you know, you guys would play the game for a bit, and then for the boss fight, you jump into like the D and D video game. And I'm like, no, we just want to play our game. This is still our game. Yeah, and it was very hard describing to people who didn't really play Dungeons and Dragons how that completely broke Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, and then eventually, when Twitch came around, it was just full live format. We're not changing anything about our game. And we were like, okay, that's pretty much the only way you could do this, but no one's going to watch four hours a week of D&D. <laughs> Little did no. they know. Now we're here, so I don't know, life, yeah. is, life is a strange, strange scenario. <laughs> yeah, it's, for us as a, as a company, too, it's been sort of perpetual catch-up, we always call it. Yeah. We've always been taken by surprise at sort of the, the fan reaction, the numbers, how it keeps growing, and how it expands into new things, so we've just tried to... Play catch up as it grows. Yeah, <gasps> yeah I got it. You got that? Got okay, it. over here. We got somebody over here. We got to bring people in for this. Yeah. Well, in the uh, the Twitch algorithm is weird. Not to out any of our friends at Twitch or anything, but when you only see the concurrent number of viewers watching at a time, that's a little hard to gauge how many people in total are actually aware in watching your show. So I think it wasn't until the first New York Comic Con that we went to and we ended up having a line around the block and we were like, oh no. Oh, <laughs> I think more than 10,000 people watch our show. I, I don't think that's accurate unless all 10,000 are here in New York City. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that took some time to get used yeah, to. Yeah, what was it? It was like a comic book store, and we we're like, oh, we'll just take the the quarter front part of your store, and we'll sign some autographs for anybody that happens to come in. And it was like out and around the corner, and that cop came in. He's like, who's who is this for? Who's this line for? Who, who is this? And we're like, it's for us. We're critical. We I was like, what are you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. yep. It's weird. <laughs> Speaking of playing catch up, as an LA commuter. The podcasts have been a lifesaver. <laughs> Good. Uh, so happy to hear that. <laughs> so what's kind of been the inspiration behind uh, some of your newer offerings? You know, Handbook or Helper, uh, Between the Sheets, um, you know, All Work, No Play. Uh, what's kind of been the driving force behind that? When we first branched off and decided to do our own content, I broke down into a Venn diagram what made Critical Role intriguing and successful. And it's clearly not just because we're people playing Dungeons and Dragons. There's a lot of D&D shows, and none of them have exploded in the way that Critical Role has. And so if one half is the fascinating piece of Dungeons and Dragons, I think the other half is our relationships as friends. And we've known each other for so long. And being voice actors, we've gotten really good at the give and take of interpersonal relationships, both on stream and off stream. So I wanted to experiment with what people were engaged in. So we kind of broke down the content into three categories, which was personality-based, which is like all work, no play, was pretty much straight personality-based, gaming-based, which is what Hamburger Helper is, and then kind of right down the middle with Between the Sheets, we were talking a little bit about how we came into becoming story storytellers as professionals. Um, so it, it worked pretty well. <laughs> um, we found that people are engaged in us as personalities. Um, Which is still weird. 
but yeah. <laughs> I say this only because I'm. I, it's it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I have my own insecurities, but I like heart you, so Matt. Many, oh, you're sweet. I heart you. But but just it, yeah, it's, it's it's been a fascinating catch up to try and figure out why things have gone the way they have and breaking them down and then going, really? Okay, yeah. cool. So it, it was kind of that. So it was why does our content work, and then the other later half of the goal, which is what do we want to do with our content? What is the goal of our content? And we discussed a lot as a company that our mission it, with Critical Role in general is to tear down the barriers into storytelling and to let everybody know that it's everyone can be a storyteller. There's a story behind all of us. And don't be afraid to get out there and tell these things, whether it's in your own personal Dungeons and Dragons group, whether it's fan fiction, whether you're trying to start a vlog yourself, um, try to lower the barriers to entry. So that's where Handbook or Helper came from, was trying to not have people be so intimidated by the player's handbook and yeah, to just there's, there's get nothing, people playing. There's nothing harder than going to a bunch of people who never played a role-playing game. Like, I want to try out some D&D. Cool. Read this. Yeah, I was out. Real, I was yeah. out. Uh-uh. Yeah. I opened up like Wizard and I was like, nope. <laughs> Calculus? Nope. No thanks. Yeah. I want an axe. Can I hit things? Cool. Just tell me as we go along. That's all I need to know. There, I watched the Hamburger Helper videos and I'm like, oh. Uh, <laughs> Six years. years later, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, there are so many pictures. Yeah. It's practically a picture book, really, like all of those player handbooks, yeah. you know? Oh, straight up, yeah. 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 This t table is technically a picture, right? Technically, yeah. Yeah. a very square, repeated picture with numbers. No. Travis? <laughs> and, Brisha, you were mentioning that, like, all of this was about, you know, letting people tell their own stories, but, and that's all nice, but was it really just a matter of getting Sam and Liam into a, a hot tub and recording that? Is that the, the main goal? I mean, if we're being honest. <laughs> oh, yeah, you just, cut to the core of us. <laughs> what can I subject my friends to and say, oh, it's for production. People love it. It's great. <laughs> Cool. So I, yeah, I want to touch on a little bit more of like, you know, turning this home game into kind of this internet phenomenon and kind of like your own uh, relationships with D&D as like a game and just kind of as a, a system almost. Um, so how did each of you kind of start playing D&D? &D? What was your first introduction? Well, I can say the first time I ever played was at Matt and Marisha's apartment for the for the very first game that we ever had. Um, I had remembered hearing about D&D &D from people, other voice actors like Yuri Lowenthal and Crispin Freeman and... And when they talked about it, I, I was always really intrigued. Um, it, it, from a video game perspective, you know, there are open sandbox type games where you can go wherever you want to and engage in certain missions as you want, but you're still limited by whatever is programmed. And the first time that we played, I was very meek and timid, and Matt was asking me things like, you know, what's your character's name? And I was like, oh, shit. Um, Grog. And he was like, okay, Grog, what does your barbarian Goliath do? And I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, what's his backstory? I was like, he makes fine leather boots. And he was like, okay, we'll get there. And later on in the game, when we were, there was this intimidation moment with a, with like a tavern keep, um, he was like, what do you do? And I was like, I mean, can I, can I do whatever I want? And he goes, you can certainly try. And I just, the first thing that like came off my head and he just went with it and rolled with it. And I was like, oh my, oh my God. Literally anything that pops into my head, you will try and roll with. And so the, the limits <laughs> off of like what you can try were just taken off. And that to me was the real hook, right? Like the, the real drug because it was like, oh geez. Yeah, I'm not limited in any way, and I think I had never viewed uh, Dungeons and Dragons in that way. And then came all the other things with the, you know, the complex characters and the storylines, and you know, just just keeping up with what everybody was doing in the in the game and how invested you become as more clay gets slapped on the sculpture. And so that's that's where I fell in love with it. And I was like, oh man, I had, I had a preset idea about what this book was and maybe how it was played, you know, because of what media back in the 80s and 90s told us, and I was just wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah both Travis and I were spoiled because Matthew Mercer was our first dungeon master. Um, so that's, that's hard to recover from. Yeah, um, for real. So <laughs> you're, ba you're Bay. Matt Mercer is Bay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't get into Dungeons and, Dungeons and Dragons until I moved to Los Angeles because I'm from Kentucky in the 
satanic panic is still very much kind of a thing there. It basically eradicated D and D, and now it's slowly oh, coming that? back. Well, yeah. Kentucky, Texas, we got a southern thing. It's you know, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I'm Missouri, yeah. so I'm down. See there? Yeah. <laughs> Double woo, slap hands. That half of the country, woo. Um, <laughs> and then I was deeply interested in trying, and we met through mutual friends, and just kind of came to you one day, and we were like, "Can you can you run a game for us?" And then after that, I went and did a few other games, but just kept coming back to Matt Mercer. Dang it. First one's free. free as I say, once you get a taste. <laughs> Part of your master plan. <clears throat> exactly. Now, I, I started in high school. Uh, I was a uh, freshman and uh, was just joined this uh, anime video game club called the Popular Arts Club that I eventually became president of and met Sanjay here, actually. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, the guys who were running it at the time were all these like track and field, like, you know, really fit, awesome kind of guys. And they're like, hey, Matt, want to play some d and I'm like, sure, what's that? Whatever. I'll do whatever you want. You guys are, you guys are cool. Is that homework? Am I doing it yeah, for you? What is it? <laughs> and, and so they, they brought me into the game. And, uh, and I, as soon as I started reading the books, like I'd seen some of the art and things about it. I had kind of an interest, but never actually dove into it. And it just consumed me entirely. And so I built this really elaborate character and like this whole theme. And I was so excited to play. And then I started playing with them. And they're great guys. Terrible, terrible gamers. Um, I love them to death, but it was it was really frustrating because I was the only one that seemed to be like, trying to push a story, and they were just like, "I want to roll high numbers and fool around." I made I remade Ryu as a warrior. I'm shooting Hadouken, so let's go fight it in In and Out. I'm like, I don't, what really? You had an In and Out? Yeah, that happened. We traveled to modern day and went to In and Out and had a burger and gained a level. Oh, this is no. legitimately one of the sessions that happened. Um, but I got frustrated and was like, I know this can be bigger. I know this can be better. So I left that game and started running my own. I invited two of my good friends to play. And I've just been dungeon mastering ever since. And it's, it's through that space with my friends that I've kind of come out of my shell as a person. I got enough nerve to start doing theater. Uh, I learned a lot about kind of honing my, my ability to be social as an awkward artist kid growing up. Um, so yeah, I've been mean, D&D, while you guys were fully formed human beings by the time it came around to you for the most part, uh, I, it was very much a proto experience for me to figure out who I wanted to be and take steps in that direction. So I'm very thankful for it. <laughs> Not as OG as some. <laughs> I'm always like, I, I played, you know, back in the mid '90s, and then I meet guys at conventions that are really awesome. And they're like, bitch, I've been playing since '73, and I'm like, yes, sir, whatever, sir. <laughs> Respect. Do you remember what all of your first characters were? We know Grog, but yeah, I do. What was her name? I mean, she was a. Control Ranger class. It was right. It was, it was, it was fourth edition. Yeah. It was weird. I don't remember her name though, but I remember she was like, wasn't she a drow? She, she was a drow. Yeah. Yeah. Because everyone's first D and D character is always a drow ranger. Mine was. You got a good drow ranger. Uh, did you also use two scimitars? Yeah. Have a little yeah, panther yeah, with you. <laughs> yeah. I think my first character was a, was a wizard. Um, but I, what I, I, but I, I imagine like the visual of Gandalf with the sword and Lord of the Rings. I'm like, I want a wizard that uses a sword. And so there was a militant wizard kit for second edition. And I was like, heck yeah, I'd be a wizard with a sword. So when I'm out of magic, I can get to the front lines. It's a bad idea, by the way. <laughs> second edition wizards especially. You have like three hit points. You should not go to the front. Um, and his name was Emeritus Trent because I was a big Piers Anthony Xanth nerd growing up. And so wow. I, I used that name. Um, but yeah, classic story. You know, he was, he, he was, a young apprentice wizard, but his parents were mysteriously killed, and he had, you know, every other D and D character yeah. ever made. Oh, yeah. um, so that was my first character, not not my proudest moment looking back necessarily, but you have to start somewhere. Start somewhere. It's so funny how the backstories are all kind of similar. I remember before the second campaign, Matt was like, "When you're making up your backstory, don't afraid to let your parents be alive." Yeah, yeah. I was like, "Yeah, okay." Yeah, like being being a hero is a pretty dangerous career in fantasy realms, so being a parent is twice as dangerous. <laughs> the minute it's you have dead. a kid in a fantasy realm, like your chances of survival are cut in the quarter. Oh, you're having a kid? Oh, sorry. <laughs> So what would you say is your kind of now with all of your uh, you know experience creating characters, creating worlds? Um, what is the process for which you could create like another character? If there when there's when Critical Role season three happens, or got her bid, your character dies. And yeah, when we all TPK yeah. this week. <laughs> yeah. Shh. I, I'm only on episode 22. The fear is real. <laughs> Just be smart, guys. We're in constant fear of TPK, so it's yeah. okay. So what what is your uh, kind of strategy uh, to create your characters? 
Mine, so Grog was just one little thing and then the next and the next. And then I think I kind of carried that over. I was one of the last people to come up with my character. I just had writer's block or whatever. And it was a flight back from Australia where I was stuck on a plane and my wife was asleep. And I was like, okay, write one sentence. And I wrote one sentence. And then I was like, and then add to that. And then maybe he has this. And it just kind of like you know, snowballed from there. So that's that's kind of how I, I did it. I don't have like a, there were some people like, I know the class, I know the race, I know exactly what I, I want them to look like. I'm like, ha, ah, how? But maybe they're just already, you know, on that ship before it sails, so yeah. Yeah, I think you, there's kind of two basic ways you can kind of go about it. You can be an inside out person and be like, I know I want to be a ranger, I know I want to be a dwarf, I know I want to be these things, and then go from there. Or you can kind of go the opposite way and be like, I feel like I want to be a circus roadie and I used ropes and I'm just really into collecting knives. And then you can kind of go from there and then be like, well, what works is like a knife wielding circus roadie and then kind of find a class and design around that way. And that's kind of become the way that I've become more interested in building characters. Um, but it doesn't say that sometimes I'm just like, nah, cleric. <laughs> and I'll be that. Um, but yeah, when I, when I made Bo, because I, I think Keyleth was more of an, out, an inside out person. I was like, I'm going to be a half elf druid and then go from there. With Bo, I was like, okay, I, I know I want to be a little bit more tactical. I wanted, I basically wanted to be like a D and D Jessica Jones. Like if Sherlock Holmes was super messed up, and yeah. kind of a juvie, yeah. and then I went from there and built around a monk. So. so I've been DMing most of my life, so I don't get to create a lot of characters. But you the create characters literally every day. Well, that's but that that's difference <laughs> between creating your player character, which is a long investment. Yeah, but you just point. made Orly. I did. Well, no, the the, the community made Orly. Yeah. That was that that, that that was a communal effort. Literally a communal effort. Um, for me, when I have played, I. I tend to wait till everyone else creates their characters and then see what's missing. I'm a, I'm a fan of filling that void. Like I'm, I, I tend to play support in that regard. Like I want you guys to all find what you enjoy, and then I'll, I know I'll find fun in whatever will make this a well-rounded experience for everybody. Um, besides, there's nothing worse than going to a, you know, a gaming table and everyone shows up with the same character. Yeah. See, glue is so important, and this this campaign, we in the first one, we were like, make sure that everybody has something that hasn't been repeated. But I think you were the only one for this this current campaign that was like, don't pick that because somebody else already has it. But we were hiding it from everybody, and I was like, I want to build a team, though. I want to make sure well, that no, well, we're I, like. I, I, I didn't say don't pick it because somebody else has. I said I said you you can overlap classes. Don't right. worry about that because there are you can build a sim. You know, two people of the same class in very different ways, and we're seeing that now with uh, sure. Caduceus and Jester. They're both clerics, but they're two very different types of clerics. Um, but that also involves having a little bit of knowledge together. And you guys were all being so secret, trying to keep your characters from each other. I was doing this delicate dance of like, okay, how do I make suggestions or nudge them so they don't end up accidentally showing up with the same characters, but not tell them what to make? You know, so it was. Uh, you guys actually did a pretty good job of, of finding different paths, though. I will say, we got lucky. Yeah, actually. <laughs> so you haven't created characters super recently, uh, but I am very interested in kind of hearing about how you build up a world. Like, you have this uh, amazing gift to just kind of set the stage and to create these incredibly vibrant locales. You're like a wizard at Dwarven Forge. Um, like, you just have all these skills to like build up, you know, environments and people and worlds. Like, how do you approach that? Like, how do you start? It's like, well, there's going to be a town and there will be some people in it, and then this person is a farmer who has, you know, serious father issues or whatever. Like, how do you do it? <laughs> it depends. Uh, if, you're, if you're just building in a void, uh, like, I'm, if you're just like, I'm going to build a world. I don't have a story attached to it. I don't have players attached to it. I'm just building a world. Then uh, it comes to, it can be very overwhelming to think of the large scale of things. Some people do better creating the cosmic end of it first. You know, let me create the pantheon and the gods and the creation myth, and then from there I can work down. To me, that's very overwhelming for a lot of people. Yeah. It's much better to start small. Like, all right, I want to make a mining town. 
and say, say, all right, well, and then this town makes a lot of money off its mining, apparently. So there's mines. I know there are mines nearby. A lot of people here probably work in some form of mining or selling supplies and tools. All right, so I'll make some supply and general stores that work in that avenue. The people live here, so they have to be, you know, a means of eating. So maybe there'll be some farms. And so you start building out kind of the, the, very, the very gentle kind of ecology of how that city will work. And then you start just seeing what different factions in there might work. You have a, if there's miners, they have to probably have some sort of union or a guild that runs them, and they probably have competitive elements inside there. And if there is commerce, of course, there's probably going to be some people that work, you know, to thieve from that commerce to try and make a living without putting in the effort, or they couldn't get a job, so now they're trying to do what they can to survive. Maybe they're organized as well, so you start creating like a see. This skill. is why when I hear that you read rocket science in your spare time, I, I'm not surprised. <laughs> like, uh, uh, what? What? It's incredible. And when you have that structure. Oh, God. <laughs> then you can start working on personalities. And, and so you, know, you work on who the heads of these guilds, who are the major players in the, you know, the politics of this city, who are the, pe the people that would be the most likely for the players to encounter to be positive you know, quest givers or in, to draw them into the narrative of what kind of conflicts you've created in this town and what individuals might be the antagonists, what powers outside of the people and the political structure are threats to the lives of those that live there? And how does that tie into the minds? And so it's just kind of starting with the small structure and then just start rationalizing how it would work together, filling in the gaps of what's missing to make it feel like it's living and breathing, and then from there decide where the conflict would arise. And then, then you have a town. But once you have that town done, you make another. And what's in between that journey from town to town? You have a, you have a, a trip there. Are there hills where bandits live? Is there an area where you know, a bunch of owl bears have been roosting in the last, last season? They had a lot of kids or whatever. Now there's an owl bear you know, overgrowth where they're just like they're, they're attacking people left and right. You know? And then you just expand and expand. That's all I think about these days, guys. It's a problem. <laughs> that was five words or less, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I, I often think of Albert Ecology as well. So. See, yeah, it's, it's just <laughs> um, the things that keep us up at night. Man. <laughs> so the common rule of thumb I've heard is for DMs, you know, for an hour of game time, there's usually an hour of preparation. What's that ratio for you? That's changed over the years. Okay. Um, it used to be that way. I'd say for hour of game time was an hour of prep uh, for the many years I was running on my own depending on sometimes, uh, a little shorter even, if it was like, ah, oh, it's just me and three of my friends and we're just gonna be improvising our way through this, it'll be fine. When we began doing the show and it began to find an audience and I realized that there were people creating wikis and you know, <laughs> you know, checking over all the consistencies in my world and, and having arguments over forums about you know, different facets of the, of the universe, I'm like, oh no, <laughs> I have to make sure this is all consistent now. <laughs> So I'd say my, my prep time has probably doubled just because part of it is the creation process and the other half is me paying very close attention to my internal lore and to keep it consistent with everything I've already said. And that involves someone's going back and researching through my old notes and double, triple checking things. And I put out a campaign guide uh, you know, a year and a half ago and that was a new experience of going through all my old madman scrawlings from campaigns you know, and sessions past and going, oh God, I have to make this legible to a normal human being. Oh, God. So I had to deconstruct all that. It's been a very unique adaption process, definitely. Cool. Uh, so D&D &D can be a very personal experience. Um, the attributes that you can kind of create or add to your characters can be deeply personal, sometimes of a very sensitive nature. I'm kind of, uh, the, the moment that kind of is freshest in my mind is uh, Sam Regal playing Not having this real issue with coming to terms with being a goblin and just feeling uncomfortable in his own skin. Um, what are your thoughts on D&D &D as being this kind of unique game where this kind of, inf like, this kind of, these kind of issues can kind of come out uh, and they can kind of be explored in a safe way? I mean, I, th I think that's, that's one of its biggest strengths. Um, I think it's, it's a safe space, especially when you have a group of friends that you've come to trust at the table to step into the shoes of another person, whether it be um, someone that you want to be more like, or somebody that is not like you at all, but you want to try and connect with and empathize with experiences outside of your own personal ones. It's a place to, to explore these themes uh, safely and talk it amongst each other. And when anybody, any, anybody crosses a line, you d discuss that and talk about it. And that person learns about boundaries as well. It's, it's a really great place to, to, to learn to fine tune empathy and self-esteem and really discovering the things in life that you appreciate and the things you want to change. 
And it's been that for me for the past 20 plus years. And even just, and, and at the same time, make, finding friends that you feel comfortable enough being able to explore that with. Like, you know, this guy, before we started playing, I knew you passingly from projects we'd worked on. And it was like, oh, yeah, Travis, he's that big guy who, you know, probably beat me up in high school. Like, you know. Oh, no. No, well, I'm just saying, that's what I, oh, you know, yeah, yeah. That, that's what I assumed because you were. Give me your lunch money, Matt. <laughs> um, and scene. Um, but, you know, through this game, you know, I, I trust you with my life. Like, you, you, you find these friends that you go through these experiences together, and you find like minded individuals that have been through these adventures with you. And I don't know, there's no other bonding experience quite like it, in my opinion. Yeah, I genuinely believe that. D&D can improve almost every aspect of your life in some way, shape, or form. Um, I mean, it, it's helped me with decision-making under pressure. It's helped uh, with leadership abilities. I mean, I, I genuinely think we kind of had this realization a few months ago that our team and our company works so well together and has done so well because we've been playing and working together as a team in this make-believe fantasy setting, fighting dragons and being in the trenches with each other for years. So when we have this imaginary memory formed together of us taking down an empire or fighting dragons, then you're like, oh, we can easily tackle this contract. That's we can do that. That's something we can get through together. Um, and so even to the therapeutic benefits of D&D, and we hear a lot, and I, I'm a big supporter in people using Dungeons & Dragons for special needs kids or people needing therapeutic benefits or, like you said, to kind of work through things. It kind of gives this alternate reality where you can take risks and experience things and you can fail without real world repercussions. So it's, uh, it's great. I love it. I think to that point too, uh, a lot of people when they start playing the game, it begins as fantasy fulfillment. It's I want to make the best character I can and I'm awesome, I'm the hero. And you begin to learn that in most cases in order to survive and to, and to see the story through, you have to know what you're good at, what your friends are good at and respect that place when that is necessary. And through that, you learn wonderful team building exercises and knowing how best to work within that team, know what your strengths are, when to step forward and when to step back and let somebody else step forward. And that plays directly to how we've all come to this company. When we all decided to, we realized, didn't decide to, we realized we had to make a company. Like I said, everything's been reactionary. We're like, okay, what's everybody going to do? And that would be a hard place in many times in my life with other people where it's like, well, we all want to be this. We all want to do this. And this, we all fit right into our roles because we all knew what we were good at. We all respected what each other was good at. And it was like the easiest creation of a company I could ever have expected. And I owe a lot of that, I think, to us having the experience of gaming together. Uh, so I do want to kind of uh, switch directions uh, momentarily. So Travis, uh, throughout the month of November, you've been sponsoring Operation Supply Drop. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Why you got involved in it? Yeah, so obviously Veterans Day is just one day in November. Um, but I remember uh, back in 2013 was the first time that I heard about Operation Supply Drop. They're this great charity that uh, it really they really support military families and members through active duty, through their transition into civilian life, and then afterwards. Um, I have a very deep military family. My, my father, my uncle, my brother all served. And I've seen sort of throughout the decades the impact, I think, that the military has had on, on their lives. And when I saw what Operation Supply Drop was doing with these, these crates, these drops that they'll do at forward operating bases, out at certain um, you know, other training centers, the impact was just immediate. And I remember my brother being out in Afghanistan and saying, you know, we got this crate in today and it had an Xbox and it had Call of Duty and all these guys that I've been bunking with, you know, we have a certain level of tightness, but when we sat down at the end of the day and things had been maybe hairier than we had expected, we came in exhausted, we were able to play and sort of have that level of escape together. And we really felt like we were back home and it really rejuvenated us for the next day. I was like, man, that's so important. And it's not just, you know, video games and, and it's, it's table, it's tabletop stuff too. They also send, you know, D and D and other things that, you know, put people at a table together, you know, promote eye contact, you know, let them, let them communicate and engage with each other in a way that, um, I just don't think they would 
without it. And they've really moved past that to also um, providing these skill training centers. So they teach them how to put together a resume, what can you expect in the, you know, the workforce and, and, and job interviews and things like that. And I think those are skills that are kind of grossly lacking when people find themselves out of the military. People go in for a variety of reasons, you know, whether to, to serve or to find their way into college or something like that. But you never really know what, what you're gonna come out of the military like. You know, sometimes it leaves a little mark and sometimes it leaves a big one. And I think that these sorts of charities are just so important to make sure that we're letting the people that serve something that's larger than themselves know that we are you know, thinking about them as well. So this month, um, Critical Role is paired with them. Um, if you have any interest, you can go to Critical Role, no, critrole.com slash OOSD. Uh, and we have a video and some more information there and we're donating all the way through uh, the month of November. And it's, I, I just, I love um, the organization. And uh, I think we're gonna do a charity like f first person shooter stream because I oh, yeah. used to be decent at those and now kind of suck. So we're gonna let people hop on and abuse me for, for a while, so yeah. Yeah, so I'm super happy with like all of the charitable works you've done, and you've or uh, that you've fundraised for, and you've had Pablov, uh, you've had Operation Supply Drop. Obviously, A26LA has been a long time uh, uh, recipient uh, to your kind of charitable givings. Um, I kind of I, I'm interested in in kind of knowing what drives all of this charitable giving because like one thing that really you know attracts me and like a lot of other folks I'm sure uh, to Critical Role is that you're always you know looking out for like the nonprofits that are you know helping the local area um, you're always looking out for other people and it's not just a matter of okay we need to make the next dollar we need to make the next dollar it's what can we do to make our community better yeah I think we I think we realized pretty early on that as the spotlight on critical role got bigger we had the ability to affect really positive change um, in the world that was something that was really important to all of us um, 826 was um, something that we started who was it that first found that was Marisha. Yeah, it was Marisha, actually right? Yeah, yeah. So me and Tallison, yeah, and team, it's, we knew that one. And they have them all throughout the nation, but it was something that I think really benefited from a very unique um, you know, perspective that we have. And when sort of the response was as big as it was, we were like, man, we kind of went around and we were like, what are our individual charities? Like, what are the things that we would want to focus on given the chance? And so we're trying to work our way through that and, yeah. and, and find ways to, to just give back more. You know, it's, it's one thing to just say like, yeah, let's, you know, let's make as much money as we can and, and, and try and grow this company and do all those things. But on the inside, the thing that makes us feel good is when we have those connections with each other and we, you know, foster positive, empathetic, you know, uh, fans and communities. And, and to us, these sorts of charities just embody the things that we, you know, um, that we really think are important. Well, consider too, like a lot of what we do with our stories and our company uh, is try and, you know, tell tales of heroism and inspire other people to rise up and be their own hero. But this is a world where there's not always the opportunity to do so or find places where you can really contribute you know, and be that hero. And I think charitable work is one of the great ways that you can do that. And so not only does it give us the opportunity to, uh, to help out, but really the community, give them the opportunity to, in the, you know, no matter what chaos they're in, no matter what busyness is consuming them, they can actively contribute to changing somebody else's life and then see the effect of that through this community. And community is such a big part of this. As much as it's like we are, us, our company, and our game and everything, like, we, we may be the, like the, the beating heart of this thing, but, but the body in the world around it is the community that sprung out of it. And uh, the sheer amount of, of positive, good enforcement and work that all the people that have rallied around this show have done, it dwarfs anything that we could ever hope to do. And I'm just so proud of, of being a part of that. Yeah, yeah it was so like self-explanatory. Like it just, there was really no other option it felt like it just presented itself as soon as we started making just these you know an appearance fee from the show we were like this is dungeons and dragons this is we were doing this anyway weird yeah this yeah. and you know so it only felt natural to be like how can we spread this in any way shape or form so and then then that's why we also we encourage people so much to go down to a two six L A or an a two six branch in their area and to teach kids D and D and start a D and D club and we kind of initiated one at a two six L A that's still going on and we've heard of several in other a two sixes sanctions city. yeah cities branches that's what we're, we're branches. I was looking for branches um, <laughs> that it's taking off there too which just warms my heart.
Thank you for all of the charitable giving you do, the, the shows that you put on every week, and thank you for being here. And now we'll open it up to uh, audience questions. So, what's your name? Hi, uh, my name is Rula. Hi, Rula. I'm a big fan of you guys. I, we watch every week. Um, one of the things about being voice actors, your voice is more associated with the characters that you guys play. But now, because of D&D &D and because of Critical Role and everything you guys do, your voices are more associated with your faces than anything else. <laughs> How has that changed? things for you guys? Like, can you even walk out on the street now? We can. Uh, it's a little harder. It's definitely changed, it's changed things dramatically. One of the things I, I used to enjoy about voiceover was the, the anonymity, where you know I could just vanish and not have to worry about that. Um, and I, I would say, while things have changed, it's not bad because like, we have a community of amazing people and the times that we do get recognized, it's very respectful and very like, hey, sorry to bother you, just wanted to say, like what you do, you know, maybe can I get a picture? And it's like, sure, if I'm not like, you know, in my pajamas at a Ralph's at like 3 a.m. trying to get, you know, toilet paper. But, um, please tell me that happened. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so it's, it's a new experience, definitely. But I, uh, and it can be a little overwhelming at, at you know, events. Uh, we're still kind of adjusting to the growth that this whole thing has experienced. But, uh, it's, it's different, but I can't say that it's, it's, Negative. Yeah, we double take a lot. Like the Starbucks that I go to all the time when I was going through the drive-thru, the guy was like, morning, grog. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Did you wish you had like ordered maybe something cooler than like a mocha java chip frappuccino? <laughs> Sometimes it pays off though. Sometimes you'll be at a bar and you'll like order a couple drinks and the bartender's like, it's on me, Beauregard. And you're like, yeah, that's happened. <laughs> it, yes, it, it, we please. Call, we call it Nerd Fight Club. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. There, there, are, there are times where that happens. There, we've been in amusement parks where all of a sudden, you know, somebody who works there will be like, hello, would you like to come to the front of the line? And I'm like, yes. Yes, I am. Yes, like, we should yeah. follow this. Yeah, this way, Mr. Durden. You're like, oh, okay. His yeah. name is Robert Paulson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it, it has come with a, with a couple of really cool, unexpected little benefits. If anything, just because we get to meet critters in the wild and be like, and really kind of see how far-reaching uh, this community is in places we never expect. Okay, cool. um, do I just toss a shot to you guys? Chuck it, well, chuck it Throw it at somebody else. You pick. Hard. <laughs> Hi. Hey. <laughs> so I know that. Uh, there are a lot of rule sets for Dungeons and Dragons as well as other tabletop games, and knowing them all is a part of playing the game, but at the same time, just kind of making it accessible and just enjoyable for everyone. So I was wondering what kind of house rules, if any, you run with. Uh, I've, I've run with a few, especially when we started. Because when we first started playing, we were Pathfinder, which was very crunchy and rules heavy. Uh, and then when we went to streaming, and fifth edition had come out for a while, and I heard that it was actually a, a, an improvement over previous editions, a little more streamlined. I was like, let's let's please move to that. <laughs> let's shift over. Um, but because it was also a new system, there's a lot of things we were still learning, and the players were you know carryover from Pathfinder. So I house ruled some things for the benefit of a larger group. Uh, I know like healing potions technically or drinking a potion is supposed to take an action in the system, but I didn't want there to have when you have eight you know seven to eight players to have one person's whole turn be drinking a potion then wait you know, seven other rounds and enemies to come before you get to do something. So I was like, bonus action's fine. That way you can still do something cool and drink the potion. So it's more, more things that, that are minor tweaks to just make it more fun and involved for the players. As you've gone into the second campaign uh, and people have got more comfortable with the rule set, I've leaned off the house rules a little bit. Um, but honestly, sometimes if it just makes for a cool moment, I'll rather go with that than the stringency of the rules. If someone has like a really cool idea and they want to do this interesting thing, and I'm like, well, in order to do that, technically they have to, to athletics roll for this thing and such a way, it's probably not going to work out. I'd be like, no, but it's a cool idea. Go for it and roll. And it makes it more interesting. The players have to have fun with it. Because at the base, at the end of the day, while it is still a game, it's more than that you and your friends trying to have a good time and tell a story together. Um, and even I'm trying, I'm still learning. I'm, I'm still finding that balance. And, you know, sometimes I'll be like, I'll look at stuff on the internet, people complaining about how, oh, they messed up these rules. And they'd be like, oh, man, I got to get better at enforcing those rules. And then I do enforce it. And I'm like, man, that's not as fun. <laughs> you know? So I'm, I'm still finding my balance at times as I go to. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so Dungeons and Dragons draws very heavily, both kind of mechanically and flavor wise, from kind of your traditional Western Lord of the Rings fantasy uh, with all of your backgrounds and kind of you know, anime and whatnot and your work there. Is there anything you'd like to see D&D &D draw from, from that pool of stories, or how do you incorporate into your storytelling? That's a good 
Well, I mean, I asked Matt at the beginning of the campaign as I was struggling to find a character voice. I had done a session that was, you know, just kind of this, like, southern drawl. And I was like, Matt, can I do that in a fantasy world? And he was like, why not? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, why not? So, you know, I think I, as long as you don't get into, I mean, well, no. I mean, I think, I think almost anything could pop in there. I mean, I think as long as it fits the flavor. I mean, even Percy's, you know, electrical inventions near the end of the last campaign were, you know, a nice dip into things you don't see very much of, yeah. you know, in the firearms, too. Yeah. I mean, even just looking at the, the bloodline of D&D, &D, there are adventures where 95% of the adventure is going through like a subterranean tomb and unlocking magical yeah. artifacts. But if you happen to go in this one chamber, you find this strange metallic craft with a... You know, a deceased creature with smooth skin and some sort of a, looks like a firelock pistol, but it shoots energy. Oh, shit, they just put aliens in your D&D. <laughs> so, like, you know, the, the, there's, there, there, there's a classic bloodline of, of toying with different genres and stuff. For me, personally, because it leans so heavily into, you know, Anglo uh, uh, fantasy and the very Lord of the Rings thing, uh, as we've played through, our first campaign was definitely meant to be an introduction to D&D for most people at the table that had never played. So I kept it very classic fantasy, and the more we played, I've kind of wanted to pull in other cultural inspirations. Um, I would love to, at some point down the road, explore more of Marquette in our world, because, I mean, I grew up loving, you know, uh, you know, Arabian Nights and a lot of a lot of ancient Sumerian, Mesopotamian religion, classic Middle Eastern history and, and, and mythology, I think is so grossly underrepresented in modern media. And so I'd love to incorporate elements of that down the road as well. A lot of Eastern philosophy and Eastern mythology as well is, is, is wonderful and doesn't get a lot of love. Um, you know, no matter what you try and create, there's gonna be some cultural touch that it comes from. All, all work is derivative on some level because we're inspired by what we experience. And we either are, in creating something new, we're creating something that is a series of other small shards that you've merged into a new combination. Um, so I just, I'm, I wanna see things that don't get it represented as well. Hi. Um, Hi. I have a question kind of mainly for Matt. I'm a aspiring DM. I run awesome. two different D&D campaigns, which is, way more stressful than I thought it was going to be. Um, I feel you, man. Um, <laughs> I have a question. I am having trouble finding a, or rather getting to a segment where I can bridge that gap because a lot of people come to D&D &D for different reasons yeah. and are interested in different aspects of it. But what I enjoy is that each one of your characters, you guys are so committed to being that character and sharing that space where you can be, kind of like let the walls down a bit. Yeah. I wonder if there's any tips or ways to kind of foster that environment to kind of create that so that they are comfortable because you can't force it. You can't force it, no. And, it, and it, it's not something that happens immediately. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I recommend is plan, if you can, extracurricular activities outside of D&D for you all to hang out and just become better friends. Um, you know, going out and seeing a movie together or going to a theme park or going and, and doing different other board games that are more of a team building exercise on the side where the pressure isn't just you have to be in character and we all have to be friends now, right? Go, <laughs> you know, we think just be themselves and get to know each other a little better. And then when they come back to the table, they'll be a little more comfortable with each other because they've had other experiences as a troop. Um, and another is, is having a conversation outside of the game about what do you all want out of this game? What do you enjoy out of this? What do you think you'll enjoy out of this? You know what, I, I get a feel for what everybody wants and have them all talk about it in the open because they'll also better understand what each player wants to get out of the story as well. And that might adjust what they're, you know, what they're looking for. If they're like, well, I just want to go and kill, kill monsters and get experience points and gold. And one person's like, I want to explore the depths of the human condition. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's hard to marry, but if both of them say it out loud, maybe the first person will be like, yeah, human condition's cool too, I guess, you know? and they'll find that middle ground. But uh, it's, it's not your onus to, to figure out that, that puzzle in, in private. You know, you can figure it out together as a group, have those conversations, and as long as everyone knows where they all stand, that also helps them feel comfortable not wondering what every other player at the table is looking for and going after. You know, they don't know their character story secrets, but you know, they can, they can, there can be unexpected antagonism at the table if all the players have that disconnect and assume what the other person wants out of the game. So having those conversations openly, I think, are a really good tool to getting everyone on the same page and getting more comfortable with each other. Thank and, you. and like, I, it takes a while too. Like, you will see progress immediately, pretty much over the next several games. But I mean, up until pretty, I mean, still to this day, we'll still check in with each other and be like, 
hey, is it cool if we like do this type of a thing, or can we explore this, or if I confront you, I'm gonna come at you. Like when um, after uh, spoilers, after Molly Molly Mock died, and we had Ashley Birch playing with us, and I knew that Bo's reaction was gonna be visceral and angry, and so I went up to her and I was like. Bo is probably going to want to come at you. Is that okay? Like, are you going to be comfortable and know that it's coming from a role-playing standpoint when I chew your head off in about 15 minutes? Um, and she was like, yeah, absolutely. I'm here for it. I'm game for it. But it still like, gave just a little bit of that uh, <laughs> expectation so that yeah, she was It takes away, like, is this Marisha or is right, it Bo? Like, <laughs> did I mess up? Am I ruining their game? You know, I didn't want anyone to think that. So I think just having a little bit of that, um, I mean, even when our game started delving into romantic territory, we were, had to check in with each other and have powwows and be like, are, are, is this okay? Like, are we into this? <laughs> and Yeah. It was more like, what just happened? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we played for like two and a half years, no romance on the stream. You know, I'm in love with you, right? We were like, <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> But, like, but that was a conversation that Liam had with me, yeah, too. Yeah. You know, like, like the, they wanted to talk about it and be like, it would be interesting, and my character could definitely go down this path, but I don't want to do that if it's going to be strange and make anyone at the table uncomfortable. And I was like, as long as you're respectful about it, I'm sure it'll be fine. And uh, it was hilarious. <laughs> Your guys' reactions were uh, yeah. hilarious. Honest. Honest. Yeah. To Honest. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Oh, over there. Good catch. Hey, uh, have you guys uh, ever considered playing another system other than the various editions of D&D? Has there been any interest in that? Uh... Oh, yeah. Uh, well, D&D &D is what our main campaign is, uh, largely because that's just kind of where we started, and that's where the world has gone. Um, and it makes sense in that space. But we've done a lot of one-shots and a lot of side games uh, where we've, we've delved into. Like, I've, I've run one of my favorite systems is Deadlands. Oh, it's so uh, good. I prefer OG Deadlands, but I ran a Savage Worlds, the newer version of it for you guys, which is fun, kind of old, pardon, old Weird West. Um, she's run a number of Honey Heist games, which is a ridiculous one-page RPG. It's so amazing. Um, yeah, like, I, I love a lot of systems out there. D&D is just kind of the classic one that I grew up with and got was my, my gateway to the rest of the systems. Um, so I, I enjoy when you have the opportunity to try other things off of our main campaign. I, I think just currently starting to dive into a new system and a new campaign, it would be like a commitment. Yeah. It would be a discussion. And one we're just not ready to have yet. <laughs> I do want to jump in on that. When can we expect Crash Pandas 2? Too fast, too Korean. Oh, no. Oh, it's so perfect. <laughs> oh, I'm looking at Regal. Oh, that one, yeah. Yeah, he's just the pin Sam down, the weird fake creature that he is. Yeah. He'd be like, run a game! He'd be like, ha, ah, you can't find me! Poof, turn the glitter and disappear. I'm like, no! It's like a, like a, it's like a treasure goblin, Diablo 3. You're like, catch, catch him before he goes away! Oh, he's gone! No! Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Any other questions, anybody? Curious to... Oh, we got... We got a repeat question! Yeah. Oh, here's the long pass. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh! oh. <laughs> Mic down. No, no. You got to lay out for it. You got to have the full body commitment. <laughs> Sacrifice yourself. <laughs> yeah, chair would have broken fall. <laughs> this thing still works, right? <laughs> um, so we got to see Talzin at Lost Con over the weekend. Oh, nice. And he's awesome. Absolutely awesome. Uh, I asked him who his favorite character outside of the party was. Maybe, you know, guest characters or characters that you've created, Matt. And I'm curious, of all of the universe that you've created, who's your favorite? Outside of parties? Outside of oh, the parties. Oh, man. Interesting. Uh, mine's Victor. <laughs> <laughs> just, just because it was spontaneous for Matt, and it was just pure gold in the moment. Like, I, think, I don't think any other story moment has caused almost every member of the table to reach for their cell phones and start filming you yeah. on stream. <laughs> it was just so good. Uh, I think mine would have to be Raishan, just because she left such a, a mark on my soul. <laughs> oh, yeah. Came out of that one dirty. Yeah. As, as a fun villain. Uh, oh, man. I mean, just from, from a 
a personal standpoint, I think uh, Sean Gilmore was a, an important NPC to me, partially because he was dynamic, but there's, there's just a lot of... When you create an NPC that you've invested a lot of time in, there's a whole bunch of their story that never gets told. And so in my head, there's this whole story for Sean's life that you know, didn't, you never get to see on the stream. And I'm like, well, one day maybe I'll find a, a place to put that. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, he just kind of naturally grew into this, this larger than life figure that I still carry with me. Um, and, uh, he's, he's pretty important to me. Other than that, villain wise, like the whole Deli Delilah and Silas Briarwood, their whole dynamic of, you know, of, of, a villain couple that their, their reasoning for their, their villainous, uh, tactics and, 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 and lifestyle has not to do with the need for power. It's, it was purely the drive f from, from one to save the other and then just still paying the price for doing that. And that, that was a really fun story to write and play out. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe we'll find some ways to dip into those stories of Sean Gilmore and others. <laughs> I hope so. That'd be fun. Yeah, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, we are actually just out of time, so Ooh, I want to thank that. our three guests, Travis Willingham, Matthew Mercer, Mercer Ray. Thank you so much for thank joining you. us. Thank you all. Thanks, guys. This was great. Thank you guys for coming.